Okay, so we are recording. All right, so welcome everybody. Um, I'm glad you all could make it. This is the, the second public meeting that we've had for the Park Hills Drainage Way Improvements Project. Um, I'm gonna go ahead, Scott, we'll just get started. So we have multiple people on the line here that are involved with the project. Myself, I'm Ron Seibert, I'm the Township Engineer and the Project Manager. Uh, David Modricker is also here with us this evening. He's the Public Works Director. He's my boss, so he keeps an eye on me to make sure I, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, we also have Scott Brown from NTM Engineering. Uh, and Scott's really the, the main consultant who's taking the lead on the design of the project. And also along with him is Brett Long from Biohabitats. Uh, who's an expert in the type of project that's being designed here and was brought into the team to, to provide that type of expertise. Ron, I'm, I'm just going to mention we do have two board members at, attending just um, for information. Uh, they're not really intending to be panelists or answer questions, but Steve Miller and Patty Stevens are with us tonight too. Very good. Thank you. Okay, uh, just some real quick ground rules in case you have not been on a Zoom meeting before. I haven't hosted too many of them. I do from time to time, but um, this is uh, basically it's going to be a, a formal presentation that we're going to give opportunities for all of you to ask questions of us at key points as we go through the presentation, and I'll show you that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, and if you haven't already done so, please put your name and address in the chat box so we know that you are here. Uh, as we go through the agenda, uh, we're going to pause after each major category and give you all an opportunity to ask questions about that. So you don't have to hold them all to the end, but please don't interrupt during the presentation. Wait till we get to the end of that item, and then we'll we'll wait and see what there is there. Um, everyone is is muted right now. If you do want to ask a question when we have the pause, either use the raise hand feature in the reactions. If you click on that, you'll see a raised hand feature. You can do that, or you can just type in the chat box. Um, I'm your host, if you will, your MC, but uh, Dave Modricker is going to help monitor those for me to make sure we don't miss anything. Uh, and again, just keep yourself muted. And then when the time comes, um, then we'll recognize you. you can unmute yourself and ask your questions and we'll, we'll just have a dialogue then. So the, the agenda for tonight, uh, there, like there's a, there's a lot we want to get over. It's going to take us a little while. And you can see initials beside each, each item there with who's presenting both myself uh, along with Scott Brown and Brett Long, um, going down through talking about the project design, uh, some of the challenges we went into, what we need for easements, construction address, access, uh, and the overall schedule moving forward from where we are now. So uh, I'm going to get started with just kind of a, a update on where we were and how we've gotten to where we are a little bit and what's happened since the last time we met. So just here again, uh, for those that maybe are new to this or haven't seen it, um, I think most of the people on uh, in the meeting here tonight are quite familiar with the project, uh, but it does entail the drainage way within the Park Hills subdivision, uh, starting just south of the homes on Devonshire Drive, there where the Smiths and the Wongs live, and then continuing down through the drainage way, uh, the first reach getting down to Princeton Drive, the next reach then going from Princeton down to Park Hills Avenue, and then the third reach from Park Hills Avenue down and ending in the vicinity of where the, the tot lot and uh, what used to be the ball field is down in Park Hills along Park Hills Avenue. So the overall limits of work, where we're starting and where we're stopping uh, really hasn't changed at all. We're, we're maintained that throughout what we've done so far. Some of the things that have not changed as well is the overall project goals. Um, you may remember these from the last meeting, although I admit it's been a while. Uh, but we really want to maintain the stormwater within the township's property or within easements. We want to eliminate the erosion and the sediment deposits that are occurring in the drainage way. And then we want to work with the utilities in the drainage way to uh, make it safe again where we don't have exposed utility lines. Um, and there's, there's a fourth one that we kind of added that wasn't in the original project goals, but it came real obvious as we were working on the project. It's not on this slide, but I'll just mention as well because we spent a lot of time on it. And that was just trying to preserve as many of the trees within the drainage way as we could. So we've kind of adopted that as a, as a project goal as well as we've moved forward. So the first, first part I just wanted, and I won't spend a lot of time on this, but just to refresh some people's memories, um, just like where we've been and what we've done since our last meeting, 
which was back on January 9th of 2019. So it's hard to believe it's been two years. We've been working on this thing just in the design stage. Um, you all should have got an update from me shortly after that meeting in April. And then again, at the end of 2019 in December, and then although not the end of 2020, it came out in early 2021 in January with you know, what we have been doing and what we have done over that period of time, just to let you know the project was still in the works uh, and some of the activities we've been doing. If you didn't get any of those updates and you're curious to see them, um, just put a note in the chat box or send me an email directly either way and I'll make sure that we get those to you. The bulk of the work that we did was really refining the conceptual design for the project and we went through a couple of iterations on that, trying to hit on all of these items that you see uh, there and they were all really had to deal with the project goals with preserving trees dealing with the utilities and coordinating with them and at the same time coming up with a project that was constructible and still not impacting the floodplain any more than necessary um, along the way there were meetings with DEP uh, with respect to permitting um, and discussions with uh, contractors who are familiar with this type of work to, to really understand what it's going to take to construct this type of a project the, the other thing that we did a lot of was budgeting. Go ahead, Scott. So um, through 2019 through the end of 2020, we went through two capital improvement plan budget cycles as well as two operating budgets. Uh, in 2019 uh, was when we really started to see the project costs escalating higher than what we originally anticipated. So we spent a lot of time looking at the design concepts um, and trying to program funds for, as you can see, design, utility relocation, and construction. And those did get included in the 2019 capital improvement plan. Then that year at the end in 2020, as part of the operating budget, the funds were included, um, I'm sorry, at the end of 2019 for the 2020 operating budget, monies were included for the design, which continued through 2020. Into the summer of 2020, as we continued to refine the design concepts, we again looked at our design, utility, and construction costs. And those again were included in the capital plan. And then as part of the 2020 operating budget for 2021, we have funds uh, continue to be programmed to complete the design and the permitting and to start the utility relocation. Uh, that construction component is included in the capital improvement plan for 2022. So again, this coming summer, we'll go through the capital improvement planning, budget estimating again, and then hopefully at the end of 2021, we'll see those funds programmed for construction in 2022. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to summarize that and say it in another way. The design utility relocation is fully funded. The construction is in an out year as a approved planning document yet needs to be funded in next year's operating budget. Right. We we have pursued grant opportunities where they've come up. Um, right now, we think we're one for three, although we don't have an official notice. Uh, in, informally, we've been told that uh, it's likely we will get a grant to help offset some of the construction costs. Uh, and of course, we continue with utility coordination. Uh, and you'll see some of the utility issues that we're dealing with. I'll go over those this evening. Um, and then through all of that, um, being confident with the conceptual designs, then we've now just started into um, the final design portion of the project. So with that right there, I guess I'll pause uh, before I turn it over to Scott and Brett to let them start talking about the design concepts and just see if anyone does have any questions at this point on the project, what we've done to date and how we've got to where we are today. You can either, you can say, raise your hand or um, enter something in the chat box. Yeah, for those that um, haven't used Zoom a lot, there's a reaction button. And um, in that reaction button, there's a, a hand emoji you can use, or you can um, um, physically hand in person. All right, I'm not seeing anything and, and we'll have opportunity for questions as we move along. So Scott, I'd say in the interest of time, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, thank you, Ron. Um, as Ron indicated, my name is Scott Brown. I'm a senior project manager for NTM and we've I've um, been the, the lead on this project um, 
uh, since the project was awarded. Um, in this segment, uh, I want to discuss some of the design challenges that influence the overall channel restoration design. Um, and then Brett Long from Biohabitats will then introduce and explain the design concept through a series of graphics to give you an understanding of, of uh, you know, why we think this, this design approach is, is the right approach for this drainage way. Um, and then it'll also provide photos from completed projects to illustrate what the design concept actually looks like in the field, um, which is a, often a difficult thing to do on a two-dimensional screen when you're seeing just a grading plan or, or some other um, engineering drawing of the, of the design. So uh, hopefully that'll give you a better understanding. Some of the project challenges um, are, listed, uh, are listed here, the first two. First one being that the steepness of the upper reach and, and actually um, uh, really the steepness of the whole channel, although the lower reach starts to flatten out a little bit. Um, and uh, I'll reference that upper reach in the upper right-hand photograph. And many of you probably have been out along the drainage way and you, um, you know, have seen uh, the boulder cascade that exists there. And we're going to try to formalize that boulder cascade a little bit and halt some of the erosion that's occurring um, on looking upstream, the left-hand bank, um, and some of the trees that are being undercut there. Uh, and so, and then the, the second, um, another physical characteristic is tree protection. And Ron talked a little bit about that, but we did send, spend quite a bit of time um, on tree protection. The initial design included an assessment of tree impacts. Um, the design team and township staff, including the township arborist, have been in the field, uh, conducted a field walk in view of some of the initial design concepts and the trees that would be impacted. And then we identified trees to avoid. Um, and also the township arborist uh, considered trees that were not in good health, that even though they may be very mature trees, uh, probably would not be trees worth saving. So we really did take a lot of time to look at the trees in the drainage way. Um, the redesign was an undertaken uh, to maximize tree protection. Then um, with utilities, um, certainly I think most of you, anybody who's been out along the channel, in this middle reach, um, there were exposed power lines, exposed telecommunication lines, um, actually in the channel. And we'll talk quite a bit more about that um, as we move through. In addition, the sanitary sewer, which in the upper reach runs down the middle of the channel and in lower reaches crisscrosses a number of times across the channel. So those are all um, design challenges that, that we had to address as part of the project. And we'll certainly talk more about. Site access for construction is another serious consideration. Obviously it's it uh, butts heads with tree protection a little bit because we have to get equipment in there and move material up along the channel to complete the construction. So that was a challenge. We did have as, and do have as part of the design team, um, a, a contractor, aquatic resource restoration company. They build these time, types of channels. That's what they do day in and day out. And we had those folks up here walking the channel, helping us um, assess the best approach approaches for access and the best approaches for construction within the drainage way. Um, so we, we have put quite an effort into making sure that, that um, we're very cognizant of how this channel will need to be built. And then the third or the fourth issue, um, floodplains. We'll talk a lot more about floodplain in, impacts um, as we move forward. And um, uh, basically what we're trying to do is comply with both township and federal regulations associated with floodplains. And there's an interesting um, conundrum that we run into in that channel restoration design really wants to raise these incised channels and, and tie the floodplains back with the channel uh, uh, to help protect the drainage way. That's really a, a, a key concept in stream restoration. But, in, but the uh, FEMA, has a regulation that stipulates that we can't increase the existing flood level by more than a foot. So raising the channel certainly would have an impact of raising the flood level. So 
you know, we had to be very cognizant of that. And we'll show you the results of our studies um, into fl the floodplain as we move forward. Um, in the next slide, um, as we move forward here, Brett will now introduce the design concept and explain um, the overall design for the drainage way. Okay, thanks, Scott. Good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm a stream restoration engineer, stormwater management engineer, and helped um, you know design the optimal stabilization for the um, eroding channel in the neighborhood. Um, this first slide is um, shows a step pull sequence for stormwater conveyance, and um, so in the existing condition, we have a deep uh, channel that has eroded down as well as eroded out um, towards each of the banks. And you know, unchecked, that erosion will continue to occur. And in these kind of steep channels, um, you know, a good approach for restoration of them is using this step pull sequence. And as you can see here, it's a series of, of steps, which are typically made up of a riffle, um, similar to a natural riffle in a stream channel, which holds grade, or um, another uh, name for the steeper features is what we call cascades. And they're typically uh, more of a, a bouldery material, um, you know, that water can cascade over, but also these structures hold the grade to make sure that uh, future erosion or that erosion that's occurring as we speak um, is arrested. So going through a couple components of the steppel sequence, it's typically um, underlain with the existing stream bed material, which is like the uh, yellowish orange haze there. And then on top of that material, um, we typically have a cobble or small boulder kind of material, um, which makes up the majority of the structure. And then at the lower end, we have a couple really large boulders just to make sure everything is held in place. Um, and something also worth mentioning on this slide is this isn't, this isn't the real uh, kind of scale of the pools compared to the riffles, as you'll see on the next couple slides. The pools are, are fairly long, I'd say 50 to 100 foot, um, typically where the uh, riffles or the cascades are more the, the 20 to 30 feet kind of length. So um, a little more pull uh, than riffle or cascades in the case, which actually does save on construction materials. Okay, next slide, Scott. And here's um, an overview, overhead view of, um, you know, on the left would be more like the riffle kind of structure where you have that that cobble section up top and then the boulder section at the bottom. And then on the right side is more of the steeper cascading feature, which is made up primarily of boulders just with some um, smaller rock kind of tucked into the gaps in the rocks. And, and a couple other things worth mentioning is, um, you know, the water spills over either the riff or the cascade into the pole, and that helps dissipate that, that energy. You know, the water is very turbulent and high energy coming over the structure, and then it hits that pole and kind of dissipates before dropping into the next. Um, so we really control where the stream energy goes with these structures rather than letting it go right at the bank or right at the bottom of the stream channel causing, or right at the, in this case, the utilities or undermining the trees, which is causing our problems out there in the drainage way. So as you can see, that flow is kind of concentrated towards the middle of the pool as it spills over, which is what we want. Okay, next slide. So um, we're going to step through um, three renderings or figures of the, um, you know, it's even uh, more than the concept design at this point. We're stepping into the, the final design. 
And, um, you know, this project's essentially split into three sections with the upstream section being Devonshire Drive down to Princeton Drive. And as Scott and or Ron mentioned earlier, the, there's a really steep section coming out of um, the Devonshire Drive culvert. Um, and that erosive flow coming from that culvert is currently really hitting that downstream right bank very hard. Um, there is some large boulders in there, but um, our intent is to help soften that curve um, as well as arrange um, the material and maybe import some rock to improve the stability there through a series of cascading um, rock structures and pools. So um, to kind of point that out on one of the images in the screen, that um, upper left-hand corner shows a profile, um, you know, with the culvert on the upper left side and then a series of steep cascades with small pools interspersed to make sure we dip and carry that dissipate the energy and carry that flow down this area in a stable manner. So on the images on the bottom um, of that area, you can see the existing um, steep area below the Devonshire Drive culvert. And then to the right of that, we show a proposed cascade, um, which shows the more organized cascading boulder structure um, with pools between each of those. Moving beyond that extremely steep section, we, we start to flatten out a little bit, although this channel is generally somewhat steep throughout, but because we have less slope, we can intersperse um, or we can make the pools longer and have a few less structures. Uh, moving downstream. And also, since these structures won't be quite as steep, um, they can be made out of smaller rock typically, um, which is more like a riffle as opposed to a cascade. So immediately um, above the stream channel there, there's an existing eroded stream bank image. And then to the right of that, a proposed um, condition from one of our other recent projects where we have a, a series of those steps and pool structures to contain um, and dissipate the energy and provide stable conveyance. Um, another structure that we have in a few select locations on this project is what we call either a boulder wall or a boulder toe, uh, with the boulder wall being, um, you know, potentially, I'm gonna say three to four boulders high, kind of stacked to protect the bank from erosion with rock. And the boulder toe would be a lower, um, maybe just one or two boulders high to protect the toe of the stream bank from erosion. And, we, and we, we only use them where we absolutely need to, such as we're trying to protect a utility. We need to tie the bank back to existing grade and, uh, and it very quickly to avoid a tree impact or a prop impact. So typically you'll see some of that boulder protection along the curves of the stream or again, like where we, we need to protect some kind of infrastructure or property. So on um, the cross section on the bottom right-hand corner, you can see, um, you know, the rendered person standing on what would typically be a, a boulder toe on the edge of the stream bank. Um, also in this cross section, um, you can see the dashed line which would be what the existing stream channel is, and then the solid line, which is the proposed stream channel. So essentially, you know, we, we grade everything. So it's a, it's a less steep stream bank, um, 
you know, we bring up the channel invert a little bit. And also, as you can see on this cross section, there's a sewer line underneath the stream channel. And that, that's also the red line that goes right underneath the stream channel on the figure. So we are very cognizant of where those utilities were throughout the design and making sure we had adequate cover um, not to impact those utilities. So there was, there was a lot of um, strains and items that we can consider throughout this. Okay, next slide. So this is um, a figure of the middle section, which is from Princeton Drive down to Park Hill Avenue, Park Hill Avenue. Um, again, very similar restoration approach. Um, the step pull stabilizing with um, select locations with the um, boulder toe protection where we were trying to save trees um, and protect utilities. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, um, there's an image of an existing um, outfall that has eroded over time and exposed some of the underlying geotextile. Um, we plan to stabilize that stormwater outfall with a um, cascading um, rock structure, which you can see an example of um, to the right of that existing condition image proposed outfall channel. Um, also to the right of that, we have a, a, an example image of the existing stream channel, which, you know, highly eroded over widens, carrying the sediment downstream, clogging the Park Hills culvert. So we plan to stabilize that with this series of um, steps. In this case, um, I'm showing a proposed riffle, and then there'll be pools interspersed between those ripple structures. And that'll help prevent the, the channel from cutting and eroding and hold grade at those structure locations. Also, we plan to establish uh, riparian vegetation, as you can see um, on that proposed riffle image throughout the corridor, wherever we have to impact or grade the stream banks for the restoration. And the last item on this figure is the bottom um, cross section. You can see the cross section there with the, the rock riffle structure across the proposed channel, a little bit of boulder toe protection on the, the one steep bank. And also you can see uh, when comparing the existing dashed line to the proposed line that we're shifting the stream channel here. I did that in a few locations where we had a very sharp curve in the stream that was causing a lot of erosion. Some of the most highly eroded parts were where we had a um, you know, very sharp curve. So we smoothed out some of those curves. So, so much of that stream energy isn't focused in those, those sharp turns. Okay, next image. Okay, this is the downstream segment or the segment from Park Hills Avenue down to the park. Um, again, similar restoration approach with the uh, step pull stabilization at the, at the very upstream end. It's a bit steeper, so we have much closer spaced um, structures in the stream channel and smaller pools. Um, that, but downstream from there, we do start to have a little less slope, so um, a little more spacing between the structures, and then you know, the flow actually um, disappears in this location somewhat, as many of you know, um, when, when a storm, a large storm isn't occurring um, because of the karst geology of the area. So at that downstream end, um, we can spread flow out into that meadow and plan to restore that area with some native vegetation. So um, as far as the existing to proposed images on this 
figure um, you can see in the upper left hand corner is the existing stream buffer, which um, there's very minimal buffer. There's mowing almost right up to the banks. And um, that can make a stream channel um, unstable because the vegetation um, or deep rooted vegetation that helps hold the banks together can't develop. So at least on the immediate stream banks, um, we hope to establish a deeper rooted native vegetation that can help hold those banks in place, um, as well as just providing, you know, it helps improve water quality and provides um, some valuable habitat as well to have native riparian vegetation buffer on a stream channel. And, and the images to the right of that is the, um, you know, what was the ballpark area. Um, right now that flow kind of spreads out there and dumps debris at that location and it's periodically mowed. Um, but, you know, as part of this restoration, it'll have less of that sediment and debris um, that reaches that location and will help um, develop some, a nice meadow vegetation there. And again, the cross section at the bottom um, is just showing the proposed um, riffle structure across the stream channel, as well as some of those native vegetation buffers on each side of the, the stream channel. Okay, next slide. It's got. Yes. I think Brett's um, having some inter internet issues. <laughs> there we go. We got it. There you got it. Um, okay. Yep. Thank you. So stepping through a few examples, um, you know, we design and implement several projects very similar to the Parks Hills project every year. Um, so I'm going to show a few example projects. This is the um, Carriage Hills Regenerative Stormwater Conveyance Project um, near Annapolis, Maryland. And this was one of this was a very steep stormwater conveyance channel, maybe similar to the most uh, upstream section of the Park Hills project. And here's just a couple images of built cascades um, with the small pools um, between the cascades. That image on the right can really show um, how that boulder cascade conveys flow in a stable manner during a storm event. And then it splashes down into the pool um, before coming through the next cascade. And um, this image on the right was very, it, it was just completed. This project was just completed. But as the vegetation develops, um, you know, it really, you won't see as much soil. Uh, that'll be green on each bank, as well as the, the trees and shrubs start to develop on those banks as well. Okay, next image, Scott. Here's another very steep um, cascade, regenerative stormwater conveyance type project. Um, this one um, is in a national park in Washington, DC. And, um, you know, forefront in the screen here is a, a relatively long boulder cascade structure. And this one is from a large urban storm drain system, but it doesn't have any base flow in the channel. It means it doesn't run all the time. It only runs during a storm event. So it, it sees a lot, of, a lot of water when it rains and then it dries up. But, um, you know, this gully was um, where this structure is, is maybe eight foot deep, 10 foot wide. And we filled it with a uh, series of these boulder cascades and it's, it's remained stable since the project was implemented. Okay, next slide. It might take a second for it to load up for me, which is okay. Okay, this 
is an example um, from Rockville, Maryland. This was the Brewood tributary. Um, and again, this was a, a red stormwater gully, probably about six feet deep, eight foot wide for this one. Um, and it wasn't quite as steep as those last couple of examples I showed. So in this case, um, the channel was stabilized more with a series of riffles um, made out of the more smaller rock or cobble kind of rock with interspersed with pools. Um, as you can see on the left hand image and on the right hand image, we did have a, a boulder cascade to tie out at the bottom end. And the banks were graded back at a more stable slope. As you can see, these banks are much more gentle than a, the previous vertical bank that was there, like you see throughout Park Hills. And then the stream valley, um, wherever the, the land was disturbed is replanted with native vegetation and trees and shrubs. Next slide. Here's another example uh, near Annapolis, the Crofton tributary. Again, this project was um, stabilized with a series of riffles and pool structures. And to keep things moving, I'll just focus on the bottom right hand image, which shows this project during a storm event. And it, it's functioning as intended. Um, at the pool locations, the flow really spreads out and doesn't have an opportunity to develop that erosive energy. And then at the riffle structure, it spills over. As you can see in that, that turbulent water in the foreground. Um, and it spills over right in that location where we have the rock to provide the protection and stability. And then down into the next pool. Okay, next slide. Um, a couple more, uh, just an example of the other structures used on the project rather than the step pool sequence. Uh, the boulder walls, which you can see in the upper left-hand image, a series of stacked um, boulders that provides protection, but doesn't look completely unnatural like um, a concrete wall or a piece of sheet pile. Um, and we've only used the wall in very select locations where we just really had to tie out very quickly to existing grade or really extreme um, erosive energies were predicted. The other two images are the boulder toe, which is only um, one or two boulders deep right at the toe of the stream bank. And that helps prevent any erosion from starting right at the toe. And an interesting point is that all bank erosion doesn't start at the top, it starts at the bottom. Um, the, the stream energy is highest right at the bottom. And then the banks on the top just fall up, fall back in on top of the, the erosion that happened on the bottom. So this structure prevents that from even starting. Okay, I believe that may be my last example slide. Are there any questions? Um, we're at kind of the end of one of the segments and we can take a pause and see if there's any questions on the overall design concept that Brett presented. And as um, Ron mentioned earlier, you can either unmute yourself and just ask a question or we can put them in the chat box or raise your hand or however you want to do that. Raise your hand. And, and, I'd, I'd like to ask a question. It's Robin, Park Hills okay. Avenue. Okay, um, so we're at that pretty deep section. Well, so uh, Park Hills Avenue out to the parklet. Uh -huh. Okay, um, we have a lot of boulders there that I have seen now um, do quite a bit of shifting. And when the water hits the boulder, it creates uh, um, more energy, I think. I think that they were stacked in a certain way and now they're just kind of lumped around and whatnot. So my question is, um, is there a, a maintenance program? Is there a follow-up to what you've done down the road to see if it's working? 
Yeah, I think there's two parts of that question. Um, and thank you, Robin. Um, the, the first part, the dislodging of, of boulders is very much a function of how they're placed. And um, what you're seeing here at the surface is just the top boulder. The design details that we use for these channels um, really tie the boulders tightly in place and create and kind of lock them in to avoid that type of problem. But not to say there wouldn't be an event that potentially could dislodge um, you know, a boulder and certainly there will need to be maintenance. I can let Ron address the maintenance side of the question. Okay. Need to unmute yourself, Ron. Sorry about that, my secondary mute. As a, as a project that's permitted, um, this is gonna be something that we'll be looking at doing inspections on annually. Um, so we'll be out here walking the channel every year, uh, completing inspection forms, just verifying that the project is still performing as it was designed. Um, and then any areas that we see that we do have erosion, we have issues with, we'll have to address those. My, my hope is that with a properly engineered regenerative stormwater conveyance channel, we don't have too many of those issues, but yes, we will be out inspecting it annually and then doing maintenance on it as necessary. And that would include the vegetation that gets planted as well. If there's things that need to be done to the vegetation, if some of the stuff that's planted dies off, then it'd be replanting that vegetation as well. Good yeah. questions. And yeah. now- the Second part of my question was the vegetation. Is it meant to be in direct support of the structure that you do? Like, you know, the vegetation will take root and it'll help to alleviate um, the erosion itself because it's drinking the water, it's, it's slowing it, you know, that, you know, so where you have rock structure, will there be trees and vegetation that'll help support the rock and all together gets kind of grown over in a natural way? I'll take, uh, I'll take the first crack at this one, Robin. Um, so, we, we designed the structures to be stable and stand on their own, but absolutely long-term, um, we want the vegetation to develop a dense root mass and really hold those banks together as well as shade the stream and provide a multitude of other benefits. But um, so we, ha we have the rock structure that we engineer to be stable. Um, we put a, a heavy duty mat, typically made out of a coconut fiber that has about a five year life, you know, up to the top of the stream bank from, um, and it helps hold all the soil and seed and everything in place um, while that herbaceous and then the woody tree and shrub layer develops. So I'd say we're not relying on the vegetation to make it through the first few years, but absolutely we want it to be part of the long-term long -term stability of the project. Okay. okay. That answer your questions, Robin? We good? Um, yeah, it, that is great. So I would love to see a plant list. Is there, is there one that, you know, part, part of something that's been written down? You guys have that? We haven't gotten that far yet, I don't think, Brett, but we will be getting there as we go through the final design. It's kind of the last last thing we typically do, um, but yeah, that is in process. Okay, thanks. We, yeah, we, we can share that. We'll also have it reviewed by the Township Arbor, the Chesapeake Bay landscape professional. So, I mean, I think we got quite a team to help make sure we get the right plants and uh, whatever input you have is appreciated. All right, that's great, thank you. I have one more quick question. On this same segment, is it, it um, does it say that you can now walk again from Park Hills Avenue out to the parklet, not by road, but by you know going down the the way we used to walk through the backyards there? Uh, in effect. Yeah. So I'll, I'll probably be able that. to show that better once we get to and up some slides a little bit later in the presentation. Okay. And, and then Dave can, can address that too, once you can kind of see it on other drawings. We have, we have more to get to. Okay. I was, um, I was just thinking about that because I was remembering as we're looking at these pictures that both the high school and the university track teams used to come through here. <laughs> it was like an event. 
And it's one away in the last few years when that island got created down toward the parklet and they stopped mowing because they couldn't get through. And I was just wondering on that end of it, if that was kind of being, you know, what was going to happen with that little island area? You know, it's just a bed of rock down there. Do you know what I'm talking about? All the way at the bottom where the, where the park area was, where the ball field used to be. Exactly. Like in the outfield. Yeah. Yeah. If you remember the one slide that, that Brett had shown, it's kind of like, intended to be planted with more like a wild flower meadow type um grass that still would not get cut very often yeah. um but there it is that top right image is kind of what's viewed for that area that right now just has all the okay the, the, the stones and, and the sediment debris that's washed down yeah so a bit like that okay, okay there there's, there's, a, there's a couple of questions in the that came in the chat box um so I'm gonna look at the the first one here from from Catherine Ross. Um, maybe for Brett, did the pools become filled with sediment? So the intent is, you know, with this project, we'll be generating less eroded sediment from, you know, the project length. But uh, um, you know, being honest. Um, sediment it, natural streams move sediment natural channels move sediment so um, if some sediment comes in from upstream um, you know it may be temporarily deposited in some pools scoured out a little bit during the next storm event um, however you know you always have that that riffle structure the pool the next riffle there will always be um, a pool, um, but temporarily some sediment may be deposited between storms, but certainly um, we're not, we'll never fill those pools entirely. Um, hopefully that addressed that one. Um, the next question in the chat box was from uh, Jerry Peck about how much wider will the new channel be compared to the current drainage? And I think that's probably one that Scott's gonna to touch on as we get into the next section. So let's hold that one for now and uh, see if that kind of addresses it. And, and Jerry, if it didn't answer your question as he goes through that, we'll come back and hit that again. And then I see a question here from Tim Bracken. Where in the section between Park Hills and the parklet where there is a lot of mowing up to the drainage area? Oh, we are in. Sorry, you mentioned having more plantings in buffer. How wide would those plantings be? So they're getting, so they're in that last section that you just uh, talked about, Brett. Okay. Um, are we are we talking down in the park or kind of the the middle of this reach here? Maybe the middle of the reach. Okay. I think I think probably the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially, you know, we're, we're planning on just planting whatever we have to disturb to implement the channel and bank restoration, as well as the access in this location. Um, you know, we're not hundreds of feet wide to do that. So um, in this location, I'm, I'm thinking we might be, um, you know, 20 to 40 feet on each side of the bank. You'll, um, you'll see a little bit, we'll, we'll talk about access easements in the next section and that'll give you, I think, an idea of how wide the disturbance may be. And that disturbance is really the area that um, we'll be restoring uh, primarily. Okay. All right, Scott, let's go, ahead. let's go ahead and get started and, and with your, your next part there with reviewing the floodplain, et cetera. Okay. And, um, that hopefully that'll take care of Jerry's question as well. So we get into it. Yeah. Okay. So in this next section, we're going to talk about the floodplain modifications and what's happening to the flow pattern as, as we design this, um, or as this channel gets implemented, how is it going to be different than what you're seeing out there currently today? So, um, as I mentioned, the floodplain impacts were an issue. Uh, we have to meet FEMA floodplain management regulations which don't allow us to increase the floodplain, uh, the flow depth by more than about a foot over what currently occurs out there. So 
what we're looking at here in this graphic in red is the existing mapped FEMA floodplain. So that's the, the red is the floodplain limit that FEMA has determined using approximate methods. And that's, that's important that you hear those words, that it's using approximate methods. So FEMA requires, as we do this project, that we use more detailed methods, more detailed mathematical methods and modeling to determine actually where the existing 100-year floodplain is. And that is the green line on the map. So you can see, in general, where the existing 100-year floodplain is typically within the red boundary, uh, which is um, the FEMA map floodplain. The primary exceptions to that occur at the road crossings, where FEMA didn't have good informa or information when they did their approximate study. They're using it basically a des desktop analysis. Uh, we used actual field survey data to establish where that flood limit is. So you can see here, the low point in the road is actually where the inlets are over in this area. And our floodplain is kind of centered on that coming across the road. So uh, it actually matches actual conditions out there. And so the existing floodplain follows the existing channel. It's a fairly steep channel, so it's a fairly narrow floodplain in these upper two reaches. Um, again, we cross uh, Park Hills here. It spreads out a little bit to go over the road and then comes down. And as we get in these lower sections where it flattens out, the model predicted much wider floodplain limits, pretty similar to what the existing FEMA limits are. But again, ours are the, the model that we prepared and the analysis that we did is based on actual topographic cross sections that were cut up through that drainage way. Um, when, uh, when we had the surveyor out there, many of you may have seen uh, the surveyor out there in late 2018 um, uh, surveying the, the channel. So that's, that's kind of how we got started. And then this next series of slides, what I'd like to do is there's some additional information here. This is a plan view. This is actually the base map that we're using for designing the channel um, that shows the actual grading, all of the structures that Brett talked about in the pools. Um, they aren't in pretty colors, but they're in black and white. And what we're showing here is in the dashed line, the FEMA floodplain again, the red dashed line is what FEMA currently has mapped as the floodplain down through here. The magenta line is our modeled existing floodplain. And the blue line is the modeled proposed floodplain limit that is based on the new channel design that we have out there. So as, again, as you can see, there are some places where our, the blue line is outside the magenta line. So the magenta line is what you would see out there now during a major flood event. The blue line is what we're saying will occur with the proposed channel redesign. And so where the magenta line goes away, like down here, the blue line is sitting right on top of it. So they're at the same location. So the flood elevations across the roadway here are in exactly the same location existing today and what will happen in the proposed condition as well. And then as we move into the next downstream section, uh, I need to get my mouse back down here and change slides. Um, again, you can see the middle section here. The floodplain is primarily um, existing. You can see the wiggle in the existing floodplain that occurs as a result of all the, the bends in the channel that are out there right now. Uh, you can see how the proposed design is going to straighten that. And our proposed floodplain limit is in the blue here. So again, very similar to what you're seeing out there today. It, it's a little different, but very similar uh, to what's out there today, what the flood limit that you see out there today. And the interesting thing here at, at Park Hills Avenue, by redesigning the channel just upstream of the Park Hills culvert, the entire 100-year flood now goes through the culvert and doesn't overtop the road. 
um, as the pink line shows here, the condition, the current existing condition, and the blue line shows the proposed condition. So the culvert will um, carry the entire 100-year storm after we redesign and re regrade the channel uh, with the proposed um, improvements. So again, let me grab my mouse here and go to the downstream reach. Uh, here we are in the downstream reach um, with the culvert under Park Hills. Uh, again, uh, a little wider in some places with the proposed floodplain, but again, it, it, it follows contour as you can see and, and um, generally is not much different than the existing. There are some places where it pulls in much tighter. This is um, this necking down of the floodplain right here is primarily due to the water surface drop coming over that structure. Um, in reality, again, this is a mathematical model. Maybe this neck will smooth out and what you'll actually see in the field may extend a little bit outside of that, but not too far. I mean, it, uh, we're using a mathematical model to simulate some very complex flow conditions that are occurring in this step pool sequence. Um, it required uh, and many more cross sections than you would normally have in a hydraulic model for a, a drainage way because of the, the complex hydraulics that is going on. Again, as we come down into the lower section, we're generally inside the FEMA map floodplain, a little outside here, um, but generally following what currently occurs. And as we get down to the lower section, um, our, our blue line is getting pretty close to the current FEMA map and the existing. So we're basically what this is showing is that the flow conditions that you're observing in the drainage way today won't change significantly and probably won't save change perceptibly with um, um, the revised channel design. Um, and, and again, remember this is a hundred year event. This is a very extreme flow event that we're analyzing here. Most of the flows will stay very tight within the channel um, coming down through there for most normal storm events that occur on an annual basis, okay? Um, so any, any I'll, I'll pause here for a second just to see if there's any questions on the floodplain analysis and Good. and Good. the proposed extent of the floodplain with the with the redesign. Um, just so you're aware, I'll also mention before we take the questions, um, as part of this, there will be a uh, uh, what's called a, a letter of map revision uh, filed with FEMA to modify the, their documented floodplain down through here. Um, that's part of our contracted services. Uh, that won't be completed until after the channel is completed and we have to do an as-built survey on the channel and then reanalyze the hydraulics down through there to establish the final um, floodplain limits that, that will be um, modified as a part of the letter of map revision to FEMA. Okay. Thanks, Scott. Uh, Jerry, hopefully uh, that presentation answered your question about how much wider the new channel will be compared to the current drainage. But if you do have another follow-up question, whatever, please go ahead, type it in the chat box or just unmute yourself, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, or anybody else, if you have any questions on that floodplain portion, what Scott described with how we <clears throat> modeled it with the proposed conditions. It's Robin again. May I ask a question? Certainly. Okay. Um, I'm wondering um, if you uh, fellas believe in climate change and does it change the definition of 100 year storm conditions? That's a good question. Uh, I appreciate that, Robin. Um, the simple answer is did we consider climate change into the future? The answer is no. There is the FEMA regulations do not require. Um, and actually, there are no regulations in the state of Pennsylvania yet that require <clears throat> us to have a crystal ball and try to project <laughs> what those changes will be. Having said that, we do use rainfall data based on NOAA Atlas 14, which is updated fairly regularly. So the precipitation data that was used to come up with the 100-year dis discharge 
um, is based on the most current rainfall, which does include uh, rainfall data through the 2000s, um, not quite to 2020. Since we started the analysis in 2018, I think the rainfall data at NOAA Atlas might, might have been through about 2015 or 2016. But if you remember, we had quite a series of very wet years in the early 2000s um, that would have been included in the statistical analysis for the rainfall that was used. So do we look into the future? No, but the data that we use does include fairly recent history um, uh, as far as establishing the, the rainfall and the precipitation and then the model runoff that occurs from that precipitation. I'll answer it in a more general aspect too. I'd say the township, you know, acknowledges effects of climate change and tries to consider, you know, resiliency in anything that we build and um, sustainability. But the um, the modeling that's done for what we still call a hundred year storm, even though they may become more frequent and we might find it down the road, we're calling those. Some other year storm, um, you know, we're still designing to to the hundred year storms. Thank you so much. Okay, I see Jerry did put a follow up in there. So um, Scott, maybe how much wider than the existing, how much wider than the channel is the floodplain? Then, like, what's the ratio from channel to floodplain? Just trying to get a sense for how much wider the final channel will be from the existing channel on average, if you can do that. Okay, um, I'll try to take a stab at that. Um, let me back up and, and walk down through all three sections. I think in this upper section, what you're gonna see is that the channel width is pretty consistent with what's out there now. It'll just be more regular and, and the flows coming down through there will be more controlled in the center of the channel. Um, and so from a width perspective here, I think we're pretty close to what's out there now. There may be some areas like up here in the Cascade where it might get a little bit wider, but not tremendously wider, not a whole lot wider. The channel physically itself um, will be very close to the, the, the same width in that section. If I move down to the middle section, in this middle section, given the erosion that's out there today, I think what you're going to see as a final channel is going to be narrower than what you see out there today in the middle section. Um, the end product and the flow will be uh, probably um, uh, narrower than what you're seeing today. The, um, uh, not to say that the 100 year storm will be narrower, but what you see as a regular channel will be narrower. In this lower section, um, through here, the channel itself is fairly narrow currently. When I say the channel, what you see from cut bank to cut bank is fairly narrow through this section. And I think, you know, there are part, portions of the channel through here where it's going to widen a little bit uh, to get, and then part of that is to help dissipate the energy. Wider channel will dissipate the energy more readily. Um, in here, in this section, I believe we're gonna be pretty close Although in this section right now, and down through here, the channel is what we call braided. There's so much depositional activity going on there that the channel, and someone mentioned an island in the, in the middle, that's the dep depositional activity. That kind of caused the channel to spread out. So in, in this lower section, I think what you're gonna see is a narrower channel in general. So it will vary through the reach, but in general, we're not making huge changes in the channel width. Um, some places it may widen a little bit, like in this reach and in, in the reach up in the, in the uh, headwaters area. And then in other sections, you'll see that it's probably going to be narrowed a little bit. Uh, and just to give you an idea in feet, Ron, what's say our average width of our open space right away in this, on the screenshot that we're looking at? Is that in general maybe 50, 70 feet across? Yeah, you're, you're probably anywhere from 50 to 80 feet in, in width before it starts to fan out, sure. Yeah, so so all that works occurring <clears throat> within that area. 
close to the boundaries that exist that helps dimensionally also. Yeah. Jerry acknowledged with a great and a thank you. So I think I think you okay, nailed that one, Scott. I got another okay, question man. here from from Patty Stevens. How much will winter freezing and thawing cause shifting in boulders and riffles? Do you want me to uh, take yeah. a quick crack? Yeah, any, think, any experience you have on that, Brett? I, I don't anticipate, um, or we haven't seen on any of our projects that freeze thaw <laughs> have any impact on the boulders themselves. Um, certainly like in the existing condition, we we see freeze thaw impact those vertical eroding soil banks. They can slough off due to some of that activity, but um, freeze thaw um, will not impact these boulder uh, riffle structures. The other thing I was just gonna add in relation to that is typically in here, at least what I've experienced is that where we have our biggest impact with freeze thaw is where we have more of a clay soils, um, where it's really expansive soil that will push more. Uh, and this majority of this channel is is more of a, um, it's a Morris and Sandy type soil. So it's a well-drained soil that doesn't tend to hold the moisture and it has voids in it for that. Um, when the moisture does freeze and expand a little bit, those voids help to uh, absorb that. So we see less, of the frost heave in this neighborhood than we typically would in other ones. All right, I don't see any other questions in the chat box or any other raised hands. So Scott, if we wanna yep. uh, go ahead and advance then yep. into construction and drainage yeah. easements. Okay, in this next series of slides, we'll discuss construction and drainage easements that uh, the township will be um, securing for the project. Um, the yellow area, again, this is the upstream reach of the, of the channel. And on this slide, you see um, some yellow and some bluish green coloration. The yellow represents temporary construction easements or excess easements. And the green represents the permanent um, uh, drainage easements that will need to be um, acquired. And one point I wanna make about the drainage easements um, uh, is that we're not, the township is taking these drainage easements uh, to provide for maintenance of the channel and, and um, to accommodate any areas where there may be flow outside of the, outside of the corridor um, that, that, that they own. So up here in this corner, obviously the channel currently cuts across. And what you're looking at here is the, the blue line is the proposed 100 year floodplain limit. So the idea is that we're taking drainage easements in areas where it probably currently floods, um, but we're just gonna uh, you know, codify that or document it with an easement that says, you know, we recognize this is a drainage easement and, and needs to be maintained as such um, uh, into the future. So that's really the intent behind the drainage easements. So again, the table up here identifies the properties and the property owners. And the yellow highlights here are the area uh, of the temporary construction easements for the yellow areas identified on this slide. And the green highlight is the drainage easements identified for the individual pro uh, properties illustrated again, just on this slide. The unhighlighted properties are in lower reaches um, where we'll be looking for temporary and permanent construction easements in those areas as well. So those are the, that's the upstream reach. Um, give you a second to digest that. So you, if anybody's online uh, representing any of these properties, you have a chance to, to take a look at that. Um, Scott, while, while, while folks are doing that, I, I just want to mention that um, th this is not intended as our one-on-one um, -on -one discussion with you on easements. So, so the township will make contact with each and every person, send out colored plats, um, provide you detail that you can look at, and um, you know have those dialogues with you. But this is this is the basis of what we'll use when we reach out to you. So thanks, Scott. Yep. Thank you for clarifying that. 
Okay, heading into the middle reach, nobody's impacted. There's no drainage or construction access easements um, needed through this reach um, based on our, uh, the current design, which is, you know, we're advancing into final design, we're through concept preliminary, and we're really moving. This is really a final design um, layout that we have here. Okay. And then the lowest, lower reach, we've got a couple of construction, um, temporary construction easements identified here. And then a few drainage easements where um, we need to get outside the township owned property or the flow will end up outside the township owned property um, during a, a major storm event. Not every storm event, obviously, but just during very major storm events um, where the water gets outside the, the township's township owned property. And again, in the table up here in the corner, um, we have the properties highlighted and we've got some areas identified for the construction and drainage easements associated with, with those prop properties. And I'll give folks a second to um, uh, chew on that, those, this slide a little bit. And correct me if I'm wrong, Scott, but I think all these places where we have these permanent drainage easements shown in the, the light blue color are places where the water is already flowing in those areas. Correct. correct. Yeah, that I mean, is we, correct. We, we tried as part of the project to minimize that as much as possible, but at the same extent, we didn't want to significantly alter the design of the drainage way to try to prevent all of that which was already occurring. Trying to keep it as natural and replicate what was there as much as possible. Okay. With that, um, Ron, I'm going to turn it over to you. There's a few more, a little more easement discussion that that we need to have here, and, and yep. uh, we'll let Ron take this. I'll take this one because I'm I'm the one that's working with utility companies, uh, and this is the middle reach, this the section from Princeton Drive down to Park Hills Avenue, and what you see is the homes that front on Greenwood Circle. In this middle reach, um, and Scott had some pictures of it earlier. You could see the transformer that was undermined and some wires that were in the channel are exposed. Um, the red lines on here uh, depict what the current existing or what I call the old existing lines are. Um, from the pole on Park Hills Avenue, the, the power comes up to a transformer that's behind the second, nope, the other way, yep, right there behind the second and third homes on Greenwood. The next part of that line from there up around um, to the north and to the west, right now that part of the line is de-energized. It's been so badly damaged through the erosion that West Penn is not able to use it. And those four homes are all being fed from the Park Hills Avenue side. Uh, West Penn had a, a need to, to make sure they had redundancy in the network because that was a primary feed for a large section of Park Hills. So they went ahead last year, if you were out there, you saw them and they put in a new, what we'll call a new existing line, which is in the light green color. Again, from the going from the pole on Park Hills Avenue, they came up Park Hills, went along the front of the homes on Greenwood Circle and tied back into the other transformer they have in the back lot. That was all done in anticipation of this project. They kind of got an early start on it because they really had a need to try and secure and provide that redundant power out there. Well, in order for us to construct the project, we need to complete that. We need to be able to remove and relocate the services that come into the back of those houses to the front of the houses. Uh, and that's not only for electricity for West Penn, it also includes Comcast for cable uh, or voice uh, or internet, as well as Verizon. I think there's maybe one or two people of the four that also have Verizon as a service there too. So as part of our project, the township is gonna be working with these utility companies to install additional conduits along that green line to get those services to the front and then we'll be working with those four property owners. We'll be coming out to meet with you individually to look at where these blue lines need to go. Those are just schematic, obviously, but that is how the power will get into your house. We know that your meters are on the backs of your homes and that where it comes in from the back is gonna be abandoned and we'll have a new line brought in from the front uh, that will be in a conduit the whole way from the transformer to the meter socket on the back of your house. Uh, as part of that, we'll be evaluating the meter sockets to make sure they meet current standards. We need to do that so we make sure they receive the conduit. Um, unlike the existing services that are out there, which are direct burial 
Uh, they're old concentric neutral direct barrier wires that are subject to fail over time. These new wires will be in conduit the whole way from the transformer to your home. Uh, so they'll be protected. All of this work needs to get done and completed prior to the contractor that would do the work um, doing his activity. Uh, so we've had multiple meetings with utility companies to coordinate with them on what their needs are. Um, and we'll be working with them to put together the required work elements in order to relocate those services to the front. Uh, and as I mentioned, as part of that, um, I'll be contacting each of those four property owners to meet with you and the utility companies just to verify and coordinate all the work that needs to get done. There would be a brief interruption in service while that work is completed, and that will be highly coordinated between the township's contractor, the utility company, and if we have to replace the meter set, also um, code so they can do the required inspections on that too. So expect that activity to occur um, later this year and, and we'll highlight that on the schedule as we get there. I think that's all I wanted to show on this slide. So I guess we can take, okay. I'm sure yeah. you folks, at least these four property owners are gonna have lots of questions and uh, I would expect that. And that's one of the reasons I'm expecting to come out and meet with each of you uh, individually at your property. So Ron, there are a Jerry, questions in the chat. Jerry okay. Peck has a question. Any idea when that consultation would take place? What month this year? Yeah, we'll highlight that on the schedule. Uh, Jerry, we're coming up on that, uh, the schedule part here towards the end. And I'll highlight that as we go through it. <laughs> we'll, we'll work around your schedule so you can travel. We'll figure that out. <laughs> expect probably those meetings would occur earlier in the spring of this year probably more like um not not now obviously we still have a lot of snow cover and i know there's even more up there in the woods uh, that's my situation too so but you know in the spring once the snow has melted off we'll probably be looking at meeting having those meetings so april may of this year the actual work though wouldn't get done until later in the year I think she was happy with that answer. Looks so. Oh, so I'd say Scott, in the interest of time, let's go ahead and keep on rolling. We're, we're already at 8.20. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I know I said two hours for the meeting, but we don't have to use it all if we don't need to. Okay, um, the next section we wanna talk about construction access. As I mentioned earlier um, in the presentation, uh, we did have on board as part of the project team, our, our representatives from Aquatic Resource Restoration Corporation uh, it's a construction company that, that builds these channels. Um, they've done quite a few channels, have worked with Brett. Brett has worked with them before uh, on projects and um, they come highly recommended uh, for this type of work. And so, you know, we look at a whole lot of alternatives for um, uh, routing the um, uh, construction access, but this is, this is where we landed. Um, the dark brown line, is the access route that mater how material will be brought into the site. Um, and then that will be also the route or the location where most of the um, construction will be staged for, from the heavy equipment that is needed to move the boulders, place the boulders, grade the channel. Um, obviously some of the work will be done channel side of this access um, uh, pathway, but um, uh, we don't, none of the work will be um, performed um, out to the north or, or away from the, the channel side uh, any more than what's, what's illustrated here. Um, there, uh, um, the light brown areas identified on the sheet are staging areas where uh, material will be stockpiled. Um, you see a staging area up here at the, the northern end of the project. Um, for bringing material in and staging it um, to build this um, fairly significant boulder wall that's going to be installed in this area and also um, work a little bit on some of the uh, structures, the cascade structures. Uh, but the primary access will be along um, this side of the channel, which is actually, I believe, channel east, um, the east side of the channel um, coming up through here. This little bump is trying to avoid a sewer manhole that's located right there. Um, but there will be 
um, a fair amount of activity and, and equipment that needs to move up, up along uh, the channel. So those are the areas that will be um, impacted. Again, any of these disturbed areas uh, will be revegetated, any of the, the trees that need to come down. Um, the con contractors will be instructed to preserve and protect as many trees as possible, which may include or will most likely include in, uh, laying down mats to protect root structures in some areas as this, this equipment goes over the root structures to try to preserve um, as many trees as possible. The path will also be um, the access road uh, will be constructed or the access path will be constructed from a uh, uh, woody chip or a, a, you know, a, a wood chips from trees that have to be taken down. Um, it'll be a fairly deep uh, wood chip path to protect um, the, the, um, uh, the soils and, and, and the, the banks below. So um, it will be installed that way and used during construction to protect the roots as well as some, some uh, tree mats may be, may be required. And, uh, uh, and then after the project is completed, the final stages will be landscaping and, and uh, revegetation of these access uh, pathways and any other disturbed areas, uh, bank areas within the project area, okay? Um, we can move down to the middle section. Again, access is shown with a dark brown line. Um, down here at Park Hills Avenue, we're planning to come in on, um, I guess this is west channel, channel right or the west side of the channel and cross the channel with heavy equipment. The reason for that is to avoid um, impacts. The channel is fairly close to the adjacent property here and we want to avoid impacts to that that property and some of the vegetation in that area along the property line. Uh, there is a very narrow path illustrated here. That narrow path is, is basically the access that will be provided for the landscaping once everything is constructed. So the heavy equipment would be coming in the access path along this way, and then it'd be much lighter equipment doing final, final grading and, and uh, landscape plantings um, in this lower area. That's what that, that uh, shorter brown line represents as we go up through there, okay? There is a note on the plan. Um, you probably can't read it at this scale. Maybe I can zoom in um, a little bit if I can make my cursor work. Um, let's take a look at this area. There's a, an area here, um, get my pointer back again. Oops, I took away my zoom, I'm sorry. Didn't know it would do that. So if you look at the lay down area, um, the lay down area, there will be guidance provided to the contractors to minimize their impact on existing trees. That entire brown area won't be stripped of trees, the light brown area. Um, the intent will be to save as many trees as, as possible and uh, but still meet the stockpile requirements for the project. Um, and we will be watching that uh, closely um, uh, as we get to the point where we're, we're um, awarding the contract and, and the specifications that we're writing for the, for the contract, okay. And then the lower section, um, again, in the upper reaches of the lower section, uh, we're primarily along, i get my orientation wrong here. I think that's the Eastern East. side of the channel. Correct. Here, um, and then it turns a little bit but it's primarily along the eastern side. And you'll notice here at the bottom, we're in the channel. Um, there was, and then we cross the channel and the access comes out. This will be the last section of the channel built. And we felt that we could use some in-channel construction down in this area uh, because it won't be exposed for a really long time. The reason we didn't use in-channel construction in the upper reaches is because of the issues and costs associated with having to, to destage and restage after storm events. And that gets very expensive to have the contractor use the channel as the access road, be trying to move equipment and materials up and down and still provide the appropriate erosion control that you need when you have rainfall events. And the, the costs 
associated with doing that became um, uh, too excessive uh, uh, to have that happen. So um, the access road, and this is the normal practice for building these track projects is to build it from the side. Um, very rarely in talking with contractors and they really don't wanna be in the channel because it creates a lot of problems, particularly when it rains uh, for them to have to you know, move things. Usually some of the partially constructed structures get washed out and have to be rebuilt um, and it really creates a mess. So um, the, the, the overall design approach is to stay out of the channel with the heavy equipment. Um, but like I said, we made an exception down here uh, because we had to get to the other side um, to get to a stockpile area that's going to be down here in the park um, in, in, uh, as we're building that. So this will be a short section that gets built um, with access in the, in the channel down to the lower end. Okay. Yeah, I wanted, to I wanted to highlight that too, Scott, that you just mentioned. Although it's not depicted in the graphic, that that area downstream of this heading towards Park Hills Avenue is going to be another area made available to the contractor to bring equipment in from Park Hills um, so that access route will continue down through there. And there's a an area there um, where the depositions are currently that they can use for staging and storage, storing equipment and materials. It's just not depicted on this graphic. Right. Thank you, Ron. Okay, so that's, um, any questions on construction access? Um, uh, not seeing anything in the chat yet, but we'll take a couple minutes. Um, I'll, I'll add here, uh, while folks are formulating any other questions on about the construction access, is that the, you know, predominantly the access is in the township owned uh, deeded area that was um, open space for the development. And while not specifically part of this project, there is an opportunity in the future to use that path as a potential um, walking path, walking trail, so to speak, for, for connectivity through the development uh, in the park and the natural area. I think a question about that I came up earlier and Ron suggested we defer it to this point. Uh, question, the walking path is not, however, a current part of this plan. That's correct. Yeah, that's correct, uh, Jerry. If, if, a, if a formalized walking path trail or something is constructed, there'd be another series of discussions for that to occur. Right. Uh, but I think the point is that that area will be graded out. The wood chips would be there. For a lot of it, it wouldn't be hard to convert it, but like this section where Scott described where the, the channel is going to be the construction path as well, somehow that connectivity would have to get made where we would cross over the channel. So uh, it's not an easy slam dunk even, uh, but it provides an opportunity if that's the direction the township wants to go in the future. Okay. Okay, um, not seeing anything else there. So uh, I guess we'll go ahead and talk about schedule. I think I'm gonna try to take the lead on this one here and we're almost done folks. So hang in there, we're getting towards the home stretch. Uh, so this really just shows from where we are today in March of 2021, we haven't documented all the activities that occurred in the past, but from where we are looking forward to project completion. So, so really mostly through 2021, here, this first block is really getting the construction design completed and getting the permit. So you can see things with respect to like Clomer, that's a conditional letter of map revision for FEMA, the FEMA review, uh, the actually developing of the construction plans, as well as what's the waterway waiver 16. That's actually the permitting process we're going through with DEP. This project actually qualifies for a waiver from permit as opposed to getting a permit, uh, but it still carries with it all the requirements you have to do in order to get as if you were getting a permit. It was a very long meeting with DEP, trust me. <laughs> it was a long meeting till we got it all hammered out, but we know the process we've got to go through in order to get, to not get the permission to do the project. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but then we have time built into the schedule for, for DEP and FEMA review. And you'll see there's about six months set aside for that. And that could involve one or two submissions or resubmissions until we really finalize 
the construction drawings and the construction documents towards the end of this year to get ready for bid. While that's going on, we're still going to be working with uh, easements. Um, we'll have the design completed. We'll feel confident about where we are. We won't finalize and execute those easements, though, until we get some feedback from DEP and FEMA to feel confident in the permitting and the approvals. But again, through this year, we'll obtain those necessary permanent drainage and temporary construction easements. As we'll also be working with what's called utility easement acquisition, but really it's it's those meetings with the, the four homeowners up there on Greenwood Circle. There really isn't a formal easement document that West Penn or them, them have, but it's really that process of meeting with you, agreeing on the alignment and the path and getting permission to enter your property to do that work. So those types of meetings, you can see I have the like May, June, July, we may be able to bump up a little bit into April. Uh, we'll try to get that process started as quickly as we can once the snow's off the ground. Our hope then is that wired utility relocation in the bottom uh, section then that's highlighted in pink with the actual construction, the physical work in the field, that we can work with utility companies on relocating that, um, the facilities there for the homes on Greenwood Circle. There, there'll be a separate contract that the township will let in order to work with those, con those utility providers to get those services completed. And the goal is to complete that work towards the end of this year. It could spill over into 2022 if we have to. As you can see all the way at the bottom in the dark brown, the construction for the project, the actual construction of the channel itself isn't anticipated until April of 2022. But we'd really like to get as much of that work done early in advance as we can. If we can get it all wrapped up in 21, uh, that would be all the better. In the upper reach, um, there's a UAJ has a sanitary sewer line that was highlighted in the one cross section. And UAJ wants to provide more cover over their sewer line. Uh, it's close to being exposed as it is. So they plan to relay that sewer main from Princeton Drive up towards the manhole that Scott had highlighted where the construction road goes around uh, as just right before we start our project. So that would be in the winter months of uh, early 2022. You can see it highlighted there, February, March, April. Uh, the intent of that is since they would be working in the in the stream channel itself where the sewer line runs through is that they would do their work immediately prior to our contractor starting so it'd be coordinated work and then the restoration for their work is actually the channel construction that the township will be doing as part of the project so it avoids the necessity to try to restore that section twice um, you'll see though on the construction uh, starting in the spring of 22 we also have a little bit of construction in the spring of 2023 and, and that's kind of held there as a contingency um, in case we can't get the plantings done at the end of 2022. Um, and a lot of that's going to depend upon the type of plantings that we have and when that construction work actually ends. If there's an ample opportunity to plant it then, or if we're going to carry the contract over into 23 uh, so that those plantings could be completed in the spring of the following year. So that's kind of the, the, the what's on the schedule coming from where we are moving forward. Um, I'll just look over here to see if there's any questions anybody has on that in the chat box or raise your hand. <clears throat> we have a question on the cost of the utility work. Oh, okay, sure. Uh, I can speak yeah. in generalities, but Ron, I, you might have. This. I can speak in specifics. Okay. So for the sanitary sewer work, I'll start at the top and work our way down. The work that's being completed by UAJA from from Princeton Drive up through the channel in that top reach, UAJA is covering all the costs for that. That's an improvement they wanna to make to their facility. Uh, so we're coordinating with them so they don't have as much restoration costs in the project, but there's no cost being passed on uh, to the township for that work. For the electric phone and the cable work that's in the middle reach, it's really a shared cost. Those utilities had uh, what's called a private right-of-way status there before the land was deeded to the township. So they had specific rights vested in that um, that allowed them to recover costs to relocate those facilities. They have agreed to do a sharing of those costs with us. So we're providing the path, basically putting the conduit in for them. And then they're providing all the new wire, the transformers and the connections um, that would go to the houses as well as removing the old facilities. The actual wires in the ground in the channel won't be removed by them. They'll most likely get removed during construction, but they'll remove the transformers and the pedestals of the, along there. So the so the electric phone and cable is a share, and the sanitary sewer is is all by UAJA. But the the backbone of the electric that's already in Ron. 
So the work that's already been done by West Penn, they paid for all of that themselves. They, they were in a position where they needed to get that done and they couldn't wait for our project to occur. So they went ahead and did all that work at their own cost. The rest so just, of it moving forward though, uh, the, the additional conduit that still needs to be put on the ground that's not there would be by the township. Uh, and then there'll be a sharing. For, for Comcast and Verizon though, there are no conduits in for them. They didn't do that when West Penn did theirs. So we'll have to install all of their conduits uh, for them to get those services into the houses. But again, they'll be pulling the wires uh, and making the connections as part of their contribution towards the project. There's a poll uh, question from Catherine. Mm -hmm. Poll in the upper middle section that has wires. Okay, um, this will be, if I'm, if I'm in the right, so in your middle reach, and you're just downstream of Princeton Drive, I believe is where you're talking about. That pole is gonna remain. Uh, that pole provides services that come into the back lot that goes around behind Greenwood Circle. So those overhead wires and the pole will be there still. Uh, they won't go away. Oops, Scott oh. jumped ahead. <laughs> so if, if that's the pole, in fact, none of the utility poles that are out there are gonna go away. There's, there's an existing utility pole on, at Park Hills Avenue where uh, the wires go underground to come up the channel. Uh, that pole will stay there as well as the one that's kind of near the side of the channel in that, well, well I'll call it kind of like an open space area. Um, just, yeah, right in there. There's a utility pole located there. I'm guessing that's the one you're speaking of, but it will remain. Is there an opportunity to share the easement and construction access documents for us to review more closely? Absolutely. Uh, no doubt, uh, as Dave mentioned earlier, as we get into um, actually formalizing the easement, for sure, we'll be meeting with each of the individual property owners that they impact. And as we move forward closer to the construction, uh, if people are interested in seeing, as somebody mentioned earlier, the plantings uh, or more details of the construction itself, we'd be glad to share those with you. The, the drainage easements may be a little more formalized process than the utility easements because the drainage easements will be in, in the township's favor and the utility easements are, are really, you know, between the private property owner and the utility company. It's just we're helping facilitate it. Correct. And from, te from speaking to the utility providers, they actually don't have a easement document for the services that are on the property. Um, they, they, the way they view it is they have permission to be there because you've requested service. Uh, but we will be meeting with all four of those property owners to verify the path where we wanna bring the conduits in from the property corners to the back of the home. And, and then since the township's doing the work, we will have a document that gives us permission to come right. onto your property to do that work. So it won't be a recorded document. It'll be a temporary uh, right document, it, basically, yes. A, a release of entry for us to be able to come in and do the work. Uh, what I didn't mention with that, I should mention too, is uh, I'm not adverse to directional drilling to try and preserve trees. I know there's a lot of very large mature trees in the vicinities where we're showing these conduits coming. So if we can directional drill for portions of these conduits coming in, uh, we will include that in the contract. Uh, and that's part of what we're going to talk about when we come out and meet with you. Okay, um, so if you wanna to jump to the last slide there again, Scott, with the questions on it, um, we are done with the formal presentation, but I, I wanna give an opportunity for anybody to ask questions about anything that's been presented or if there's something that hasn't been presented that you have a question on, this is a great time to do that. And I also wanna highlight my email address that's on this slide. If you don't already have it, uh, jot that down, please. I have an email list for people that attended the first uh, public meeting on this and I'm keeping that current as much as I can so that as we get towards the construction of the project we'll use that to provide updates to folks on a more frequent basis uh, as we get closer to the design bidding and construction stages of the project so if you want to be on that list and you don't think you are already it's like if you haven't got an email from me recently like within the last month uh, then I don't have your email so shoot me an email jot that down um, and send an email to me if you want to be added to that list. Or if you're traveling the world during construction, <laughs> you want to know what's going on in your backyard. <laughs> you got it. 
So yeah, floor is open. Feel free to enter in the chat box or go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, it's kind of open forum here for a bit and then, then we'll wrap it up and say thank you. We're already getting folks saying, uh, you know, thank you. So uh, we also want to say thank you for attending. If you um, have other things to do or really don't want to for the Q&A, you know, feel free to, you know, leave the meeting as you see fit. Um, we're here for questions and uh, yep. you know, on behalf of the township and the design team, thanks for attending. Yeah, and I think as I mentioned very, very early in the beginning, uh, I've recorded this meeting. So uh, we're going to provide access to that on the project website, on the township website. So I'm going to go through a process to get the web page updated for this that we'll have all of these slides as well as the full recorded meeting if you want to see it again so uh, or just, anyone just, that couldn't attend just a, a note ron and um have you have you already made arrangements for that because i know we're limited on the capacity of zoom recordings that we can keep i did confirm that with nick okay if we exceeded it it'll be my apologies and so noted on the web page <laughs> Uh, if you did join, the, if you, I'm sorry, if you joined the meeting late, if you didn't hear this announcement, uh, if you would please enter your name and address in the chat box, if uh, you hadn't done that already, just to have a record of all who attended. Sorry, Dave, go ahead. If for some reason we weren't able to keep the entire recording archived, we'll still have the slide presentation available that can be viewed. Absolutely. On yep. The PDF version of it will be there. Yeah. I don't see any questions coming in on the chat. Uh, just to confirm, if folks do have questions, we um, and and thank you and, thank you and good night for your for your comments. Uh, we'll stick around a little bit, and if you want to raise your hand uh, with the emoji, that's fine too. I don't think we got any questions coming in, gentlemen. <laughs> okay, and I'll just say lastly, you know, if any any time you have questions, there's my contact information. You can email me or call me. I just <laughs> don't call the number that's on the slide. That's wrong. <laughs> What'd you do? It's not two three eight two four six one. I don't know how that got in there. It's two three eight four six five one. Sorry about You're that, right. folks. <laughs> it'll be it'll be corrected when we post it, but uh, I think all of you know the main number of the township building, uh, right. and you know how to get a hold of me. <laughs> okay, with that, uh, I'm going to say we're done. Uh, thank you, Steve, thank and you, Steve. Um, we'll say good night to you all. Yep. Have a great night. Yep. Have a thank you. Good night. Good, good night. night, everyone. Thank you. See you, Brett. We'll see you. All right, I'm going to stop recording and then close out. See you guys. All right, good job, gentlemen.